Welcome back to another episode of the Bear Trap, a Bears podcast by a Bears fan. I'm your host, Terry, and today I'm going to talk a little bit of Bears. Like I mentioned, I am on Thanksgiving break. Actually, um, I'm only in town for a few days uh, before I start traveling, so I uh, wanted to take some time because I got free time. I want to talk about some other stuff, but also, I probably won't be on uh, till the end of the week, so... Wanted to make sure I got some extra content out there. But anyway, today I'm going to um, revisit the Nagy conversation in my uh, comments to clarify a little bit and expand upon that. i um, going to look at fantasy free agency, just something I posted um, on the page and thought the uh, results were interesting. So wanted to go through that. And then I'm going to talk about the Adam Shaheen business. And honestly, this is going to be my last time talking about it. Um, yeah, so there we go. So let's start with the Matt Nagy stuff. Um, so yesterday, and this is something that I have to myself continue to work on and I'm admit fault to, uh, and that's the nature of podcasting is that I say things and I communicate it in a way that I believe people understand what I'm saying. Uh, and I try to continue you know, continually get better at that. But sometimes, of course, you know, you see the comments and everything, the conversations, you realize it doesn't always quite come across 100%. So, uh, for, I'm, I'm assume most people, and I want most people, but I'll assume the people that I've had conversations with actually listen to the whole thing. Um, so I, I'll just go from there and uh reiterate my thoughts about it and so what i was saying i think one part that a lot of people were missing was that um i was saying as far as if you ask me and this is the way i'm framing it if you asked me what should the bears do to best capitalize on their window of opportunity right now my answer would be to move on from Nagy. As I mentioned, so some people, you know, talked about just giving him time to grow and all that. That's fine. I, I'm not saying that, you know, him getting time won't help him grow because my main issue is experience. My point is, is that while he's growing, then we're getting closer and closer to losing our talent. And as I mentioned, the question is, do you have faith that we can rebuild and retool the talent so that we will have another Khalil Mack? Or we will have another Kyle Fuller, another Eddie Jackson, that we will have another receiving core like the one we have. Do we trust the current organization to redo that again so that by the time Nagy's good to go, we have a talented roster? And my answer is I don't think so. So for me personally, as I mentioned, if I'm talking about moving on from Nagy, I'm talking about specifically to capitalize on our window of opportunity. As I mentioned, if you were talking about slowly getting rid of assets or kind of, you know, just retooling, and rebuilding, then fine. What do you have to lose? Let Nagy uh, grind his teeth here. And uh, maybe when you're in position to turn it around, maybe you like Nagy and you want to keep him or, you know, maybe you move on and he works somewhere else. I don't know. But for me, that's that's my answer. And I know it's unorthodox. And again, I'm not saying this is what I think will happen. This is just me saying what I would do. And so if you're talking about uh, unorthodox things, we've seen it. Record don't always mean everything, especially when you look across sports. There's times where people who have records that um, that got fired or good records, excuse me, that got fired. And there's people with bad records that probably should have been fired and kept their jobs. And so it, it just depends on you maneuvering it. And I, I don't always like to compare apples to oranges, but you think about basketball, different contexts, but. There's coaches of the year that get fired. There's people with playoff records that get fired. You think about Mike McCarthy. I mean, they won a Super Bowl with him. They like, what's the time limit on that? And so he, he ended up getting fired. It's just depending on, cause at the end of the day, 
Aaron Rodgers still has a window of opportunity, and they don't feel like he was best for Aaron Rodgers, so he moved on. So, again, it's not always going to be the orthodox method, and I don't think I was saying this to somebody not to uh, call him out, but I don't think it's dumb to say, uh, wow, someone has a good record, so, but we can still have that discussion about, you know, what's happening. I don't think it's smart to say, wow, they got a good record. Okay. No need to think about anything else. It's got to be more than the surface level. It's got to be more than just numbers. Numbers don't tell the whole story. And there's people like, he was coach of the year last year. And okay, McVay was coach of the year too. And, you know, so my thing is, is, okay, you had a good record last year. What does that mean for right now? As far, does that mean, okay, you guarantee success? Cause it doesn't look like it. And so the thing for me that I feel confident and always is that my arguments don't come out of thin air. Like some people, these are the same things I talked about when Nagy was hired as far as his experience as far as uh, the things that I wanted to see as a head coach. And it's just so happened to come to fruition where it didn't work out so far. And I don't have confidence that uh, why do I think in next year, all of a sudden it's going to click and he's going to have all the, you know, uh, ability of a veteran head coach. It's not going to happen that way. Same way it hasn't happened for McVay or any other young coach. It takes time. But the difference is, you inherited a team with a lot of win now talent. Same thing that McVay did. And that we all know that's the blueprint we're uh, following. That's not typical. It is not typical for new head coaches to come in to high talented, high expectation teams. It's, it's not, it's, it's just not. And so this kind of reminds me of what I was talking about Fox because people hated Fox. And I agree, like the offense, it got a little ridiculous at times. But also, I, I think about pace in that too. And so, I the same thing I said about Fox. Because it's so funny that people are using the same argument to justify Nagy. When Fox was getting all the criticism, I looked back over the, year, uh, the few years that he was there. And I was like, not to take moral victories... But we were getting blown uh, the hell out with Tressman. <laughs> and when that, uh, up until that point when I was talking about Fox, our average margin of loss was less than three points. Average margin of loss was less than three points. I said we look prepared, we look professional, we compete, and we actually scrap. The difference with Tressman is that we were in the wrong gaps on defense. Coverages were being blown over and over, and we just weren't professional. But I was like, look, I'm not saying we shouldn't move on. I already recorded all this, actually, so you could go back and see. I'm not saying we have to keep Fox, but I'm saying there is, between the lines, again, record doesn't say everything, uh, an argument to say that with Fox, he changed things around. Now, enter Nagy where you got a defense that for the most part has really stepped their game up and they got Fangio. And then you also uh, bring in the weapons on offense as far as putting money into offense like you did not do with John Fox. You know, Allen Robinson, Anthony Miller, Taylor Gabriel, uh, far cries from uh, what we had before with John Fox. And so... It's understandable for people to look at that situation and say, well, it was just Nagy. Nagy fixed it. And that's not the case. As humans, we want things to be as simple as possible. We want it to be black and white, but that's not how it works. It just was a happen. Uh, it was a, it was a circumstance. And uh, there's some people that's like Fangio covered up Nagy. I don't believe that's true. The thing is, you had a perfect storm. A lot of factors go into it, but people don't want to consider them. You don't want to look at the schedule we had. You don't want to look at the fact that uh, we had new offensive weapons. And even our offense wasn't great. Our offense looked way better than it ever had, but we had a completely different roster. It'd be different if you had the exact same roster and then Nagy came in and completely switched it around. Because the fact is it looked different. It was like, yeah, it looks different. So it must be effective. 
But here's the point. It's not effective this year. And so now you start to see, okay, was it that the offense was so much better last year or was it just better because you were comparing it to Fox's offense? And then, so that was the factor. And then again, you inherited Fangio in the defense. And so all these different factors come together for last year. But people don't want to look at that. They just want to make it simple. Nagy. Yeah, we, we coach of the year. Nagy. Boom. And I get the, the, the award thing I don't care about. I, I said this for, it's a glorified best record award. That doesn't mean best record always gets it. I mean, glorified. So it's like, who had a high record? and that we can contribute a certain story to. So, like, Belichick's not going to get that. It's like he always does that. But it's like, oh, the Bears were here. Now they're here, and they got a good record. Okay, Nagy makes sense. He must he must be the common denominator, and that's not the case. And so when I always talk about apples to apples and getting closer to the truth as possible, you got to look at the entire picture. So all that to say... That is unorthodox, not saying it's going to happen, not even saying that I'd be 100% uh, convinced to do it, but if I was asked to take over and say, hey, what can we do to take advantage of this group, I would just say move to another coach. And some people ask me about Pagano, and I'm like, you know what, that's a good question. I, I don't know, but as far as Fit in all the things that I mentioned Nagy is lacking. He does fit those, those, uh, that bill. So it, it could be possible. It could be possible if you had an offensive person you really trusted to come in. Cause then you essentially be doing the reverse. You would essentially have Pagano, and his people taking care of defense. And then you'd be bringing in an offensive guy to completely right the ship. The, the problem with that is that that offensive guy has to right the ship and he has to uh, develop Mitch Trubisky. That's tricky. But again, to me, it's not just remove Nagy. Uh, Some people take it as that. And I've said, again, that's not true. I literally said my feelings on uh, Trubisky are the same. Trubisky's future is not here. I still say you need better talent on the O-line. I still say that you need to get a veteran quarterback to either bridge or compete against Trubisky. Some people just act like it's an either or. It's not an either or situation. It's a both and. So I could say get rid of Nagy. That doesn't mean, okay, Nagy's the problem. I literally said it's not about the offensive blame. It's not about the Trubisky blame. This is separate from that. This is head coaching ability. And so when I say remove Nagy, that doesn't mean, okay, bring in another coach and all of this will be fixed. Because people are like, well, what about the O-line? You're telling me that the, the, anybody with that O-line is going to be bad. Anybody with Trubisky is going to be bad. I'm like, I'm not saying one move. This isn't a fantasy game. This is literal real life. You can move to a veteran head coach and bring in competition at quarterback, and improve the offensive line. You can do all those things. All those things need to be addressed. Um, I, I thought I made this clear when I've said it a thousand times. There's blame to go around everywhere. So there you go um, as far as the naggy comments. And again, I'm not saying that's what's going to happen. I am not saying uh, that's my prediction. I'm just saying if you ask me again to take advantage of to compete in the tough NFC North in a tough NFC, if you want to make Bears contender still, that's my that's my uh, play. If you're talking about hey, let's you know kind of roll with the punches and wait till we get a new window. Then you're talking about trading Khalil Mack. Then you're talking about might as well keep uh, Nagy and let him develop because he might develop into a star. You never know. And so that's how I feel about that. Now, that's not fantasy talk, but this is fantasy talk. So I posted on the um, page, on the YouTube page. Uh, definitely check out the community section if you don't, if you're a subscriber and you don't. Um, just post some stuff there sometimes. And so 
uh last night just decided to put uh like a little fantasy question a free agency fantasy so i basically said if all of these players were available which one would you want the bears to sign if we only could sign one and so the the options were tyron smith left tackle from dallas travis kelsey tight end from kansas city Jalen Ramsey, cornerback from the Rams, formerly of the Jags. Quinn Nelson, left guard from the Colts. And Drew Brees, quarterback from the Saints. So the uh, results were interesting. The number one that everybody voted for so far with 67 votes is Quinn Nelson, 45%. So uh, by far the highest vote. People wanted Quinn Nelson. Now, Quinn Nelson is an interesting one. Because I don't know how much he fixes. I mean, maybe potentially two spots. Because what you can then do, what I would do is put Quinn Nelson at right guard. But what you could potentially do is just move James Daniel over to right guard and have Quinn Nelson at left. Now, James Daniel is far more athletic than Quinn Nelson. And you typically run to the right. I would personally probably put Quinn Nelson at the right guard. But either way, you're just affecting the two guard position. So you you solve the coward problem, who is absolutely trash. And so you do bring a level of toughness and uh, immediate power to the to the team. A, a amount of power that we've been missing without Cal Long in his prime. Uh, cause as good as, as good as some of the guys are at certain things, they're not good at power. None of them are. And so it would be weird though. The, 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 and that's the other issue. Cause James Dan is a second round pick. He's super athletic, maybe mentally not picking it all up, but you're not going to get rid of him. Cody Whitehair, you're not going to get rid of him. The man can't snap and they still let him uh, start. You're not going to get rid of him. And none of these guys play tackle. So really, you're talking about keeping exactly what we got, just plugging in Quinn Nelson. So then my issue with that is that it's weird because you got a lot of quick zone guys and one really good power guy. And I think it could help, but um, it just be a weird mix. And so I'm not uh, entirely sure what that adds. Uh besides the obvious uh talent but yeah i don't know i mean if it said quinn nelson or nothing i take quinn nelson but i don't know that he'd be my first choice when i think about what that would mean for the team so the second choice travis kelsey uh, about 25 percent uh so look i'm gonna get to the tight end stuff in a little bit travis kelsey play or play for uh matt Nagy uh diverts a lot of attention even if he's not open yeah i mean you can't argue to me he's the best tight end in the league and so the thing that i'll say about travis kelsey that a lot of people don't know or talk about is that travis kelsey to me was a top tier prospect uh coming out in the draft i mentioned this before but it wasn't because of what he is right now To me, Travis Kelsey was a top-tier prospect because he blocked like a left tackle. The man was probably the best blocking tight end I ever graded out coming out of the draft. Uh, And you think about his brother, um, uh, Jason Kelsey, who's a center for the Eagles. Makes sense. He's got the O-line background and mentality. And in Cincinnati, honestly, that's what they had him do mostly is block. Now he's thinned up. He he's gained some speed, and he's become a absolute pass catch threat. But best believe the man can block if you need him to as well. So I understand it. Adding him would be big time. What would that do for our team? I'm not one of those people crying, blaming the O line. So I do think with uh, the three to four seconds that Trubisky gets, uh, it could help. But Trubisky. It, Eh, that's the tough part. And honestly, with Nagy and what I've seen from Trubisky, I don't trust it because then it's just going to fall in love and force feed Kelsey and not in a strategic way. I mean, literally just that's the only person they're going to look for. But I think since he's Trubisky so in love with Allen Robinson, that having another person to be in love with 
might spread him out a little more. Because even if you think about the Giants, what started happening in that third quarter? He started falling in love with Anthony Miller. And I said this early on about Trubisky. I said in the NFL draft, players, young players tend to, especially quarterbacks, tend to continue to do what works for them because they're scared to fail otherwise. And so early on, Trubisky couldn't do anything but make positive plays when he ran. And he started falling in love with running. They start making plays when he threw it to Robinson. So he fell in love with passing it to Robinson. Last game, Miller happened to start having a good matchup. Start forcing it to Anthony Miller. and But Nagy's similar. He, oh, we made it in a play action. I'm going to fall in love with play action, even though our run game hasn't gone nowhere. And it's not the same effectiveness. The only thing he hasn't fallen in love with is running that I formation. But anyway, I wonder if that would spread his, uh, you know, interest out. But anyway, third on this list was Drew Brees. Interesting. If you're talking about bridge quarterback, you could do a lot worse. The only issue, because I think Drew Brees helps a lot of things. The only issue is the age. And so it's like, it's a very short commitment. And he's not very athletic. So um, some of the, you know, a lot of things aren't going to be on the table. But when you think about Sean Payton, they didn't need any of the spread concept stuff with a mobile quarterback to make their offense work. Not saying that uh, Nagy is Sean Payton, but um, it'd be interesting. Uh, He would be one of my top thoughts for sure. I would think about Breeze before I thought about Quentin Nelson. I put it that way. Next up was 6% Tyron Smith. Look, Tyron Smith is the best left tackle I've seen play in a long time. Um, A lot of people talk about Joe Thomas. Joe Thomas was not a great run blocker. Tyron Smith can do it both. And Tyron Smith at his peak is an elite uh, pass protector. Question is, is he still at his peak? And you talk about Andrew Whitworth, people like, oh, talk about old age. Look, he's shown that he can still monster. And so he's not as good as he used to be, still very good. Is Tyron Smith very good or is he still great? When healthy, I still think he's great, to be honest. But every year keeps creeping up. Now, what happens with Tyron Smith? You knock out three positions. I don't care what you say. You can argue with me about the O-line all you want. Um, the tape is the tape, but there's also perception about what is a good block and what's not. We can have that debate. If you're a coach, we can have that debate. Charles Leno is way better than Bobby Massey. I mean, I don't even think that should be a conversation. Tyron Smith at left tackle puts Leno at right tackle, puts Massey at right guard, where I used to really be against big, tall guards. Um, And I still, if I had my way, wouldn't pick one. But we've seen some players, especially failed right tackles, move to guard and really dominate. And so I think Massey's better at run and he's better where he's not on the island. And so unfortunately, our tight ends aren't great at blocking. So he hasn't been able to because basically when you bring like a Eagles or a Dallas Cowboys or Colts, When you bring all those tight ends in, you basically turn your right tackle to a guard because he's not on the island anymore. We haven't had a chance to do that. So I think Massey would play a lot better at right guard, way better than Coward. So there's that. So then you're talking about a three for one. Tyron Smith protecting the blind side. Leno, who would be one of the most athletic right tackles out there. And then Massey inside at guard. And so... You're talking about better pass protection on the tackles, and you're talking about more power inside when you add Massey. So that's one that I really get excited about. Lastly is Jalen Smith or Ramsey, excuse me. Jalen Ramsey received 4%, uh, which is 2% less than Tyron Smith. And when I talked about Ramsey before, here's the thing. What does he add? Yes, you got all the issues on offense. So that's the number one thing people might, it doesn't help the offense. So I don't care, but I care because that takes you to a new level on defense. 
People really don't understand how much of a luxury it is when you don't have to use your safeties to help your corners. You can be so much more creative, but even not being creative, think about this. Kyle Fuller playing five yards off, play after play, where he has the green light to jump any short routes. If there's nothing short, he can drift back in the zone, help out on the deep routes. But you're talking about Kyle Fuller with Eddie Jackson over the top of him, and he can jump any route that he want to because Jalen Ramsey is going man-to-man the other side. Or you got Eddie Jackson effectively playing a, um, a robber position every play where he can really move around and really just rob the middle of the field. Dude, like, it's already hard to pass on us. People talk about our pass rush and sack numbers. As I mentioned, it doesn't mean crap to me. It's mostly covered sacks. I already went through every sack from last year, so you can go look at that. To me, our pass, uh, pass, our secondary pass defense has been crazy. And we're not the same this year, but I still think we're really good. Add in Jalen Ramsey? I mean, dude, dude, you, you, and one of the things I'll talk about in the future is the offense does struggle, but you got to think about starting field position as well. As good as the defense has been in certain statistics, realize teams have driven the ball on us. And so it's like, oh, they didn't score. They only got three. That's nice. But understand when you let teams drive on you, it flips the field position. Excuse me. Which is one of, I mean, that's a chicken or the egg type thing, um, where it's like, we don't move the ball, so the offense gets a better head start. But there's times where the offense had bad head starts and they drove the ball on our defense, or they at least moved the ball. When you're talking about adding Jalen Ramsey, you're talking about darn near suffocating teams. And I'm talking about not only more turnovers, Not only, uh, you know, better shutdowns, but you're talking about better field position because it's going to be a lot harder to move the chains on us if you're not running the ball. And so me personally, if I, you know, gun to my head, if I had to pick, I would probably pick Tyron Smith followed by Drew Brees because I believe Tyron Smith can play more years than Drew Brees. But Drew Brees would effectively really change a whole lot on our offense and at least give us time to get to a younger quarterback when we got a first round pick or something. And then third for me would be Jalen Ramsey. So uh complete, almost complete opposite of what the votes were, but it was fun anyway. All right. So last part, Adam Shaheen. So I made a comment about Adam Shaheen and going back and forth about Shaheen and, t- and Burden and all this. Let me say this, number one. I don't say this to defend a certain player. Like, I don't know. I've never met Adam Shaheen. I never met Trey Burden. Um, before Roquan signed and everybody wanted his head, I never met Roquan and I was defending him. I don't do any of the, even the old line or anything I talk about is not to defend people. I don't care. What do I get from that? All I'm doing is trying to get you to be better Bears fans. I'm trying to get you to consider the full context. That doesn't mean you have to agree with me, but if your argument, look, if you came to me with an opinion that's different than mine, but your argument was only about stats or record, then I already know you didn't look at the full context. And so my thing is to push everybody to look at the full context, not so we can talk about Shaheen and this draft pick, but so we can talk in the future. Hopefully, as I continue year after year, we'll see fans that are thinking on a higher football level. And so with that being said, I've said this before, And I'm going to keep continuing to say it. Tight ends are not what they used to be. And it's not because of the numbers. It's schematically. And so understand that when tight ends start having this success, some people say it's a mismatch nightmare. Excuse me. And you saw that with Jimmy Graham in the red zone. 
But other than that, I mean, Gronk a little bit. But other than that, it, it's not because they're mismatched nightmares. It's simply because they're zone eaters. If you look at most of these productive tight ends, their big plays come on zone or play against zone or on a play action. That's usually what it is. And so people kept talking to me about Shaheen. I'm just like, okay, every say he doesn't get separation. Uh, he doesn't run good routes. Okay. That's your argument because I said, look, if you believe the advanced stats, which I don't always do. And so again, if you believe him, he's had 19 targets over his career and he's only had one career drop, not pass broken up. We're talking about where he dropped the, the ball in the regular season. That's what the advanced stats say. So if that's the case, we already know he hasn't had a lot of playing time. If that is the case, then you telling me he's a bad route runner and he doesn't have good separation. Okay. Well, as far as I can see, he had only dropped the ball once. Okay. So, so, so at this point, we're not saying he can't catch. We're not saying, you know, he doesn't have physical ability. We're saying he's a bad route runner. So the only answer you can have, especially with something like that, because there's stats for separation and all that. Trust me, I would never in my life believe that stuff. So the only answer for that is to go to the tape. And look, I went to the tape. I, I looked at the incomplete passes as far as the NFL film. As far as the NFL film, there's only 11 incomplete passes associated with Adam Shaheen. Guess what? All 11 of those incomplete passes had in common. It was against man coverage. So you say, see, he can't separate. Well, guess what? I went to all of his completed passes and his touchdowns. Uh, guess what? They had in common. Play action or zone against zone plays. Okay. You're like, well, you're proving our point, Terry. Well, guess what? I went to the top tier tight ends. And I'm not saying Shaheen or any of these guys. But I looked at a Kittle. I looked at um, uh, Travis Kelsey, a uh, Zach Ertz, and guess what? All not all, but majority of their touchdowns or big plays have in common. They were on play action or against zone coverage. It is very rare, and again, there's a couple of them. Kittle and Kelsey come to mind. It's very rare that a tight end can run. Uh, routes against man coverage on a defensive back and completely get separation because it's funny i hear these two things hey he doesn't get separation he also doesn't box people out well okay like i don't agree with that but it's like you can't box people out if you get separation <laughs> and so the thing is most of these tight ends what you can't get separation in zone coverage because it's a zone and so you're not, no person is sticking on you. And so a lot of times where it's these big plays, you got miscommunication off of play action, which means the team is a good running team, or you got um, zone coverage where they run to where nobody's covering them. And the quarterback does the job of giving them the ball. And a lot of these guys are good yak players. Now, Shaheen's a big dude, might be hard to tackle him up high, but he's not a big yak player. I mean, he's fast for his size, but he's not uh, any of these guys as far as a catch, you know, or run after catch. So I'm not, I'm not saying he's that. But as far as the point of when you get the ball and how you get open, it's the same stuff. So it is all scheme dependent. If there's anything you could ever learn from me, 99% of the NFL players are scheme dependent. There is a small 1% of players that can be elite or great in multiple contexts and multiple situations. Most of these players are very dependent on the scheme. So guess what? The difference of you calling a tight end great, because you're looking at numbers, that's uh, honestly like tr trust me if Travis Kelsey didn't have the numbers he had you wouldn't even look at if he was still running the exact same routes doing everything he still does 
except the ball wasn't getting to him because he didn't have a quarterback. Or they didn't scheme him up to be open on the zone. You would not call him great. You only look at numbers. And so the difference between you thinking somebody is great, trust me, is the difference of someone scheming them open and having a supporting cast that can get them the ball. And so when you try to point out Shaheen in a vacuum without considering the routes they're asking him to run, without considering the defense they're going against, without considering Trubisky's ability to get him the ball, because don't make me pull the tape up. I'll pull up the incomplete passes, and I guarantee you most of them is because Trubisky didn't put the ball in a place where the only the receiver could get it. He put it in a place where the defender could get it. And so you talk about the expectations for Shaheen and being, um, you know, kind of, they said baby Gronk. He wasn't baby Gronk. What he was was baby Jimmy Graham. And the fact that he's a converted basketball player. So they say, oh, he's not good at this or this or that. Number one, most tight ends aren't good at blocking. None of our tight ends are good at blocking. They keep saying it like somebody on the roster is better than him. They all suck. And guess what? Most of your favorite tight ends suck at blocking. And so anyway, you're talking about route running and all that. And I, I agree. I said he's not any of these guys as far as talent level. But at the same time, he's a converted basketball player. And so the only real example you got is Jimmy Graham. What did they do for Jimmy Graham very early in his career when he came out as a converted basketball player? I watched the touchdowns, and we all remember it. Red zone, red zone, red zone. Literally boxing people out. Literally jumping over people, rebounding. Look at Shaheen's touchdowns, the only ones he's got. Guess what they all were in the red zone. And so you sit here and try to, and guess what? He doesn't have a lot of those targets. But even if you go back to the Chargers game where I showed you on film, he was open. They tell me he can't create separation. He was open in the end zone. In the end zone, it's a lot of, it's a lot of space. And so, especially when you're on the island and you got those two way goals, he created, so he was open. Trubisky didn't give him the ball. And the other time it was batted down by the D line, it would have been a touchdown. And that's the difference between you saying somebody's good or can play and saying somebody was a huge bust and the worst pick ever and you hate him and F him and all that. That's the difference. That literally is the difference. And so, again, he's not a great elite tight end, but to act as if he has no talent or no place or business in the NFL is absolutely ridiculous. You look at the amount of times he's able to be in a route. You look at the amount of plays he's played. He just has not had the opportunity to show us what he really can do. And the the few times he had that opportunity in the red zone, he cashed in. And so for me, if you're talking about Shaheen, you're talking about injuries. You're talking about early on not really gaining the confidence and the threat ability that Jimmy Graham got just being the end zone guy. They tried it a little bit, but again, that's before we had a different type of offense. And so that's, that's where you were. Then injuries piled on top of that. And I don't know how he is. He could be a terrible uh, player at practice and everything and might not have deserved to get on the field. But when, what I've seen on the field, I'm okay with. And again, this isn't to advocate for Shaheen. This is not to say I, we should keep Shaheen. This is for you to think more nuanced. Players aren't just good or bad. That's not how it works. It all happens within context of football. A lot of factors go into it. So that's my piece on Shaheen. If you ask me again, I'm going to say the same thing. I, and, and this time I looked at the, I was completely open to look at the film, to be proven wrong. Look, he's stiff. He's fast in the straight line. Look, I pull up my reporter, Shaheen. I wasn't a big fan of him. I was not a big fan of this pick. But you can still look at things in context. And so I'm not going to say I wasn't a fan of the pick, so I'm just going to attack him. I was right. No, I'm going to look at the full picture and see what's real. There are downsides. But there are upsides, and there's some things in his control, some things out of his control. So that's it. That was a lot. So go to the comment section. 
Let me know what you think about all those topics. Share it around, get the conversation started. Check out the Patreon if you're thinking about supporting financially. Thumbs up, subscribe, and remember, stay up and bear down.